This is our 22nd lesson. We'll be looking at a follow up of introduction to the Bible. And we're going to follow this up with the question of do we have all the books written by inspiration of the Holy Spirit? There are religious groups that claim we don't have all the books. They claim that the 66 books that are used uh, by us and by a number of our religious neighbors, uh, that they are not all of the, of the canon. There's other books that should be in the canon. That's the claim. So we want to deal with this question. And uh, do we have or do we not have all the books? Several religious books claim that the Bible is incomplete, that new books have been written, and even are being written that should be part of the scriptures. It's vital since our ability to determine the will of God is based on our knowing that we have all of God's will. If we don't have all of God's will, then we might be doing, not be doing something we should be doing or not be doing something that we should not be doing. Is the Bible complete? That's a very good question. We have all the books written even during Bible times. Have other books been inspired since the first century? Remember, we've argued that miracles ceased near the end of the first century AD. If we do not have all the books written by inspiration, then the word of God has passed away. But Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. This shall not is emphatic. We won't look at it though, but it's very emphatic. Word of God has not passed away. That's my argument. Therefore, we do, we do have all the books written by inspiration. We don't have all the books written by inspiration and the Word of God has passed away. Word of God has not passed away. I deny the consequence. That written against the antecedent. It proves that we, we, the Word of God has not passed away. Therefore, we do have all of the books written by inspiration. So that's my argument. Every word, what about some books in the Old Testament? Some say some were lost there. The word sefer in Hebrew, a translated book, sometimes refers to a letter or a brief account. Gesenius, in his Hebrew Chaldee lexicon, says this word sefer is a writing, the art of writing or reading. He cites Isaiah 29, 11, and 12. Whatsoever is written, use of a bill of sale, for example, Jeremiah 32, 12, of a charge or an accusation. So it's some kind of written document, a bill of divorce, of a letter and of a book itself. This is Gesenius and these passages he cites, page 594 in his lexicon. Book of the Covenant. And this is a book, it's a book written, a writing about it. So it is translated book, Exodus 24, 7. And he took the Book of the Covenant and read it in the audience of the people. And they said, all that Jehovah has spoken, we will we do and be obedient. Book of the Covenant is already in the scriptures because you're just reading what's in the text of the Bible in this context. And so he took the book and he'd been reading. It's, it's talking about the parts of the, of the book of, uh, book probably of Exodus here. It's already part of the scriptures. In Numbers 21 and 14, before it is said in the book of the wars of Jehovah, by Fahim and Sufa and, and the valleys of the Arnon. Probably an account of the victory over the Amalekites given to Joshua. It was not intended to be part of this canon of the scriptures. Just an account of a battle. And it's already been summarized. And Joshua won the battle and how it happened. 
So it could have been a, an account of it that was written without the guidance of God. The, the children of Israel just wrote an account of it. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the nation had avenged themselves of their enemies. Is this not is not this written in the book of Jasher? The sun stayed in the midst of heaven, and the day should not to go down about a whole day. So we have something called the book of Jasher. Josephus claims it was an historical record kept of the nation, but not need to have been kept by inspiration. That's what he claims, and here's the site in Josephus' writings. Whether he's right or not is another question. Some think this refers to the book of Judges. It would fit the book of Judges. Joshua 10, 13, and the sun stood still and the moon stayed, so the nation had to bend themselves of their enemies. It is not this written in the book of Jasher. And the sun stayed in the midst of heaven. They should not to go down about a whole day. Uh, the problem with this is, in the book of Judges, the book of Judges generally agreed to have been written after the book of Joshua. So, and it has information over a wide period of time. I don't think that would fit very well, but there are some commentators that claim it. Uh, but the word Jasher is uh, Strong's number is 3477 Hebrew, and it just means, uh, we'll see here, it just means the righteous. Some think it refers to the book of Judges. Josephus is claims of the historical record. So let's define the word Jasher. Straight, level, right, pleasing to God, which is right, pleasing the eyes, acceptable to be straightforward, just, upright, or uprightness. So it's talking about someone who's doing what's right in this passage. And so that would fit several of the books, and it certainly could fit the, the books of Judges, but Judges appeared to have been written later, see? So it would uh, be the words found in 119 verses in the Old Testament, you need to just say right, upright, or righteous. It doesn't have to be a book written by inspiration. Okay. It could have been something, some text of some of the Psalms even, which did glorify and praise uh, the victories that the children of Israel had. Some of the Psalms did. So this could have been that, or it could have been something just written by righteous men and they wrote, but they didn't write the inspiration. God didn't intend to save it or keep it. What about the sayings of Solomon? 2.233. And he spoke 3,000 proverbs. His songs were 1,005. Well, there's not that many in the, in the Old Testament. So we don't have all of them recorded. So what do you speak about in these proverbs and songs? And he spake of trees and of the cedar that is in Lebanon, even unto the hyssop that springeth out of the wall. He spake also of beasts and of birds and of creeping things and of fishes. So what did he talk about? He's talking about plants and animals and fish and wildlife. And these will be creeping things. Well, so he talked about Creeping things could be reptiles, it could be uh, insects, or it could be both. And so he's talking about biology, both uh, animal biology and plant biology. So he's talking about that. Now, what do we have here? There's no evidence that these were written down. He spoke of it. Some of these relate to secular matters and not important to man for his salvation. He spoke these things to confirm that he was a prophet. But possible 
I think very likely here. And some of these things related to things that blessed Israel, how to raise various crops, how to do things such as prune vines, prune your tree. It's possible some of these things the Sabo principle of horticulture so that Israel could raise their crops well, how to fertilize and how to rotate their crops and do other things. Such things such as grafting, pollination of plants, how to prune plants, when to perform certain things, and, and or principles of animal husbandry. Principles of insects might be even how you can keep and uh, get rid of some of your insect pests. Um, I know that you can plant certain uh, bushes around or plants around. I think marigolds, if you plant them in your garden, they will drive away some of the insect pests. By the, just by the fact that they're there and they won't harm your vegetables. So there's things like that that could have been revealed by Solomon uh, for the sake of children of Israel being blessed and being able to produce food for themselves. All these, all of which blessed Israel, things of that nature. Uh, we just don't know what it was for sure. The Jews probably knew at that time, and they may have passed it down. There's, there's some ideas that uh, Solomon did reveal things like that. I wrote unto you, First Corinthians five nine in my epistle, had no covenant with fornication. See now, there it says it's someone says there's an epistle we don't have. Well, we do have it, and we have to understand that the nature of the writings of the Greeks. And we'll get back into it. We've already dealt with this earlier. Maybe we dealt with it in the hermeneutics class as well. And I may not see as if I seem as if I would terrify you by my letters, or his letters they say are weighty and strong, but his body presence is weak, the speeches of John Count. That such a one reckoned this and what we are in word by letters when we are absent, such we are indeed also indeed when we are present. So Paul wrote here my letters in plural. So they argue that there must be more than three epistles to Corinth because he uses the plural here. And so in First Corinthians 5, 9, yeah, I wrote, and that's past tense, see. That's, that's the argument that's made. But we have, uh, this might be an epistle which we began to write but did not send. That's a possibility. But this has occurred in one other instance in Jude 3, for example, where Jude says, Beloved, while I've given all diligence, write unto you for a common salvation. I was constrained to write unto you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which is once for all delivered the saints. I was constrained to do this, but uh, I felt it more important than writing over a common salvation. It would be an example of what's called epistolary errors, which I think that's the proper explanation, which Paul refers to the letter of 1 Corinthians. But it's a Greek idiom. Now, idiom, no, it's not the word idiot. It's something that is peculiar to that language. And it's called epistolary errors, which a document will be written or something will be written in the past tense because when the epistle is received, it will be past tense. We, get, we gave more details on that earlier. Now, in 2 Corinthians 10, 9, he says that I may seem as if I would terrify by my letters. Okay. But if this is a pistol of Harris, he says four letters are weighty and strong. So he is now using, I believe, the pistol of Harris. So that easily explains that. It easily explains 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 
whenever we go back to the passage in First Corinthians chapter five, let's go back to it. Let you see what I'm talking about here. I wrote it in my epistle. I had no company with fornicators. Well, he just said that in the prior verses. So he'd just been talking about that in the prior verses. And that's exactly what we see here. Now, I'll go back and illustrate it again, because rather than having to go back to those earlier lessons where we talked about this. But a bulletin, a writer of a bulletin, uh, might write the bulletin on Thursday, and he may have it at the church building on Sunday and hand it out. And it'll have the list of who's who is uh, assigned to um, lead the pr first prayer, maybe the second prayer, he's going to lead singing and so forth. Well, in that case, you'll write it in a different tense. Now, to us in English, tense is time, but to Greeks is kind of action. See, I, I wrote this as, as completed acts. So I wrote it, and it's like in the bulletin. They'll, they'll say in the bulletin, today we will have a, a meeting, a business meeting at the church. And, or today we will have, and they'll be in the bulletin. Or today we'll begin our gospel meeting. And so that, that could occur. In that context, then, it's written on a Thursday, distributed on a Sunday. So when he wrote it, he wrote it like it was present tense. And they, they understood it. I wrote on you. Or he could say, we, we began our gospel meeting yesterday. Okay. So you can you can put it in that way, and we do that in our bulletins quite frequently. Frequently, we already discussed that. So his letters, and again we have two letters for Second Corinthians, and if it's Epistle or Eris, he could be talking about both those letters. They may refer to his writing to other churches. His letters may. Which were being, which were circulated among the churches, as we've already argued, and so this could be referring to those letters that it's out to other churches. That's certainly a reasonable re re possibility. The first Saint Corinthians were not his first two epistles. It's almost generally agreed, First Second Thessalonians were probably his first two epistles. It may refer to both First Saint Corinthians. It may refer to be a Greek idiom in Pistarius, or it may refer to other epistles he had written. Well, someone said, well, what about that epistle in Laodicea in Colossians 4.16? When this epistle had been read among you, it's John the Colossians, that big epistle we call Colossians, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, he also read the epistle from Laodicea. So there was an epistle from Laodicea. Now, does this mean an epistle that Alexander wrote? That's that's entirely possible. It might be that they had written an epistle to Paul, and he had answered it. Maybe he answered their their questions in the epistle of Colossians. Okay. These two towns were just a few miles apart. So I've set forth that this is an epistle from Alexander to Paul which would explain his answer. Perhaps he sent Paul some questions regarding spiritual matters, and they're incorporated in the book of Colossians. Church at Corinth had written a Paul a series of questions. I'm not concerned with things where you wrote unto me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. So the church had written him questions. Help us with this question, Paul. Church and Laodicea also wrote Paul some questions. I have asserted that this is an epistle that Paul wrote from Laodicea. Now, that's entirely possible. May have written some epistle from Laodicea when he was in Laodicea. 
there and exist an epistle that goes by this name, but the evidence is overwhelming and spurious. It looks like a composite of various texts from Paul's writings, what it looks like. And here's the link for more information on that. Right. Some assert this refers to the epistle to the Ephesians. That's a definite possibility. I'm convinced that the book of Ephesians is a circular epistle and that Paul sent it out to the region, probably known as the province of Asia, that region, which would include Colossae and, and Laodicea both. Paul may have written this to both Ephesus and Laodicea. This possibility. So, uh, circular epistle. Possibly the church at Ephesus made copies from the other churches, including Church of Laodicea, which was, were to be copied from other churches by inspired scribes. We just don't have any information here. Laodicea was destroyed by an earthquake in AD 60 and 61, which could account for copies of this epistle to that city not being widely disseminated. I think it's very likely that it's the book of Ephesians that we know as Ephesians that he's talking about. So entirely Ephesians appears to be a circular epistle. Now there's several reasons for this, but a good textual study will get into those reasons. But let me give a quick one or two. The epistle doesn't mention anybody from Ephesus. That we know that Paul was there for some period of time preaching, working in the church. It doesn't mention anybody from Ephesus. And, uh, but he does to the Colossians. He mentions a bunch of people in the Colossians epistle. So he does typically mention those in the churches where he writes an epistle. Even to Rome where he hadn't been. But he mentioned people there. So he doesn't do that in Ephesians. But if it was a circular epistle like Galatians is, you wouldn't be mentioning people in one individual congregation. And so that, that appears to be a circular epistle. The epistle from Laodicea, the word from is translated from ek, the Greek word ek, which is out of, might be referring to the epistle Paul wrote while he was in Laodicea. That's a possibility, that's what it reads. There are several Greek manuscripts of the book of Ephesians that have the words in Ephesus in Ephesians 1, 1 omitted. They have omitted, they do not have these words. Papyrus 46, an old document, Aleph, Asterisk, and Beta, and B, which would be Sinai Beta Vaticanus, uh, Asterisk, uh, Codex 6, uh, Codex 1739, and Marcion. Both, both, all of these sources leave out the words in Ephesus in Ephesians 1 1. So it would make sense if there was a change in the reading. And uh, what, what happened is that each church had the words in Ephesus, in Colossae, or in Laodicea, or whatever, in the text of the copy they were sent. And that would be the only difference in it. And the one that Laodicea had lost whenever they were destroyed by the earthquake just a year or two after this happened, if this was written. This would be expected if the book entitled Ephesus was a circular epistle, what we call Ephesians. It's a circular. No other books have been able to pass the test of infallibility. So we don't have other books inspired since the first century. Scriptures reveal that miracles would cease in, 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 the, in the first century, I believe near the end of the first century, in 1 Corinthians 13, 9 through 10. And other arguments I make in my two books on the work of the Holy Spirit. If they ceased, it takes miracles to write a book, and there can't be any books written since that time. That's pretty simple. 
truth was revealed during the lifetime of the apostles. Jesus promised this to them. Through 14, where he tells them, I have had many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. I be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he shall guide you into all the truth, for he shall not speak from himself. But what things so he shall hear, these shall he speak. He shall declare unto you the things that are to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall take a mind and shall declare it unto you. So here Jesus promised them that they would be guided into all truth. The apostles, this was a promise to them. That had to have been fulfilled before they died. I argue that all of the apostles died in the first century. Therefore, there's no new truth to be revealed at any time after the apostolic age. Now, we're talking about spiritual truths. We're not talking about chemistry, mathematics, and stuff like that. But we're saying all spiritual truth that relates to man's salvation was revealed in that time before the apostles all died. So after the apostolic age, there was no place for a new truth to be revealed since it had already all been revealed. Since all truths are revealed in New Testament times, these books, that is, books written after the age of, of the apostles, after the age of miracles, cannot be new truths. They either say what the uh, New Testament says, or they contradict it. If they contradict it, they can't be scripture. If they don't, if they say the same thing, they're redundant. Not necessary. It's either not truth, therefore it should be rejected, or where they restatement of the church in the New Testament, they're redundant, they're not unnecessary. We summarize in the lesson of the years. We have all the books written by inspiration of the Holy Spirit during Bible times. And claims to the contrary are based upon bad logical reasoning. There's mostly begging the question. No other books have been inspired since the first century because miracles ceased near the end of the first century AD. The alleged lost books are, part of, are already part of the scriptures. And some of the alleged lost books concerned secular matters were not preserved. They were blessings to Israel, I believe, many sayings of Solomon, for example. But uh, this information, to some extent, has either been lost or it's been passed on by word of mouth. And the neighbors of Israel were got this information from the children of Israel. No other books are able to pass the test of infallibility. Deuteronomy 18, verse 22. 22. Remember, they must agree with other scriptures. And uh, Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 4. If they are scripture, they have to agree with other scriptures. If they don't agree, they can't be scripture. They must not have any internal errors. Remember the, the scriptures in 1 Corinthians 13, 9 through 10 reveal that miracles would cease in the first century. Therefore, no new books are being written today. Have been written since first century. All truths are revealed in the lifetime of the apostles, John 16, 12 to 14. We should not look for more truth than what was revealed in the first century. We need to save us. John 20, verses 30 through 31. Add that to your notes, sir. Any questions?